Everybody who's here is a testimony of some part of God's amazing grace in your life. You're a testimony of what God delivered you out of, what he redeemed you from, what he saved you from, what he healed you from and rehabilitated you from. You are a miracle proof. Every person that has been through a dark night, you're the, you're the proof of Psalm 30 that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the... You know what that tells us is that darkness is temporary. Darkness is temporary. Darkness is temporary. Weeping may endure for a, a night while things are dark. It is temporary. Whatever you're dealing with, it is temporary. It's great to be with you again. I'm so, so honored and delighted. It's always a joy to be able to just come into the house of God and, and, and be blessed. I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm amongst family here. I really do. I have so much love and affection for Pastor Chris and Vanessa. They are incredible people of God. And uh, you're in a safe place. This is a safe place. Um, I'm grateful to Pastor Terry and the foundation that he laid here and his vision even to be able to extend it. And it's wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful to be able to see what wonderful, wonderful things that God can create in such a loving, loving environment of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm just blessed to be here. I'm glad that you're here. I'm, I'm more glad that he is here uh, by, by his incredible presence that, that he brings into our life. So God is an awesome God and, and, and we love him and we honor him and, and we really do give him glory for, for who he is and for everything that he does. So I hope that you guys get something out of the, the word of the Lord. I, I, I really do believe that it's a sin to bore people, so I don't intend to, <laughs> to, in, to engage in that activity today. You know, I think that uh, you ought to have uh, fun when you come to the house of God. You know, there ought to be joy uh, in him. Uh, you, ought to, you ought to be lifted. Uh, I, you know, and I, I'm, I'm so intrigued by the by the end of the world series here, you know, my goodness, I think I'm gonna have to cheat and sneak online and see, see what's going on. My goodness, that's, that's the beauty of technology. It allows you to be in different places uh, at, uh, at different times. But anyway, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about a heart for the house, a heart for the house, uh, meaning the house of God, the church, the church that, that Jesus died for because he so loves it. Uh, so the foundational text here is uh, Psalm chapter 27, verse 4 through 6 in the King James Version of the Scriptures. Notice it says that one thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. It's not a matter of if you're going to have trouble. It's a matter of when. And so that's why he says that in the time of trouble, you need a hiding place. You need a comforting place. You need a, a strengthening place. And then verse 6 says, and now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me, and therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Because here is King David, and he could have asked for anything. And he says, one thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing. It wasn't for money. It wasn't for fame. It wasn't for good health. He says, one thing have I desired of the, of, of the Lord, that I may inquire in his temple, and that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. I want to be in God's house. He not only had a heart for God, he had a heart for God's house. Because in the house are God's people. And, and I want you to understand the house of God is not, it is not the brick and the mortar. In the same way that uh, when you talk about Jerusalem as being a, a, the holy city, it's not a city of brick and mortar or glass. If, if I talked about Dallas or Plano or Carrollton or wherever we are, 
If I talked about this as a city, it is not about uh, infrastructure. It's not about gravel. Whenever you talk about the incredible people of Texas, you talk about Texas, it's not about the massive lands. It's the people. It's the heart of the people. It's the spirit of the people. And that's why when you get in trouble, you need people. People don't only need God. People need people. You know why? It's not a matter of if you're going to have trouble. It's a matter of when you're going to have the trouble. And let me just tell you this. All of our sanity is held together by another human being. People help us to be who we are. I mean, if we'd ever be honest, every man has to say, you know, my God, if it weren't for my wife, if it weren't for my mother, if it weren't, weren't for my father, that there has to be somebody else that actually helps to hold us together, just to hold us together, to hold us accountable. Because sometimes if you get angry, if you get emotional, you might want to step out and do something sort of unwise. I'll just phrase it that way unwise because you're into your feelings. And who do you have whenever you get close to the edge to be able to talk you down? Because sometimes human beings can make you so angry and you need one other person that is the voice of reason when you're getting ready to go out and do something that is unwise. To be able to talk you back down into the land of reason. And that's why it is not good for people to be alone. And we don't just only need God. We need each other. People need people because God put gifts in other people to be able to help us. That's why it's important that we don't merely just come to church, but that we are the church. We don't just do church. We are the church. So when he talks about the church to be able to, to inquire, it's not about a direct locale. It's not about brick and mortar. It's about the people that make up the place. It's about their smile. It's about the power of their praise and their worship. It is about their counsel. It's about their encouragement. It's about their ability to be able to pray for you when you're going through something or to be able to give perspective to somebody because You've suffered with cancer and God walked you through a process and was faithful to you. And now somebody else is in the beginning stages of diagnosis and dealing with the shock value of that. Someone else has a child that has a substance abuse addiction. Someone else is addicted to pornography. And you've already walked through those storms in your life. And sometimes you just need somebody who's been there and has seen the faithfulness of God over time. To give you a perspective. If, if you ever get uh, clouded in the world, uh, you always need a change of place and a change of pace because a change of place and a change of pace equals a change of perspective. And if you'll ever just get to the house of God when your house gets crazy, when your work environment gets crazy, when the members of, of your family get crazy, when your friends get crazy. You need to get to a place that's a change of place and a change of pace. Slow down and just be still and know that he is God. We are connected all of the time. And it's interesting that our devices charge by being plugged up, but our souls charge by unplugging. And when we unplug and come together, Wherever there are two or even three, chi three in the original Greek, wherever there are two, chi three, there I am in the midst. So it becomes the dwelling place of the abode of God. And, and here's the great power of that. Most of the time, if we ever need provisions from God, it's like, God, I need something from you. I need something from you. Don't just come and send them what you need from him. Learn to enjoy the presence. When a newborn babe enjoys the presence of, of their mother, they need her milk. They need her milk. And it is the baby's cry that sends an alert to the mothers for the milk in her body to let down. And not only is she nourishing that baby physically, but when a newborn is born, 
They only have visual focus of about a maximum of 18 inches, roughly the distance from the the mother's bosom to the mother's face. So while the baby is getting nourishment for its body from her bosom, he's also beholding her face and drawing something of emotional strength, of validation, saying, you matter. The smile that she gives to him is also nurturing something in the soul. And that's why you can't just get something long distance over a text message. You have to get in the, in the presence. There's something that presence brings us. And that's why whenever we come together, what beautiful worship today. What incredible worship. And I love the lyrics uh, the, of the songs that really speak about our being a, a dwelling place that, that will, uh, can glorify Jesus Christ. It's, it's not about us. It's, it's about him just getting into his presence. You know why? Because most people rush trying to get the provision. It is insulting when your own children want nothing but your provision from your hand. In the same way, if we come to God and we're just trying to get something from him. God says, I, I, I miss my time with you. Let, let's, let's talk. Let's, let's have fellowship with each other. That's why he says, come over to my, my house. And that's why there's a comfort. David said of everything that he could have asked for, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, that I might inquire in his temple. Whatever questions that are in my heart, in my soul, God, I want to come to your house and inquire about that. I want to ask you about it before I go to Google, before I ask Siri about it, before I ask Alexa about it. I want to go To you, I had a a friend of mine, he told me, he said, I don't have to use Siri or Google because my wife knows everything. (laughs) But it's it's, it's amazing that the one who is omniscience, who knows everything, he says, just come, come into my presence. And when we praise him, when we praise him, praise invokes God's presence. Our praise invokes God's presence. There's a process to get to the provision. You can't rush to the provision. We insult God. God says, I'm going to spend some time with you. So we praise him and the praise summons God's presence. When God's presence shows up, it's like a little kid and all of a sudden somebody has been bullying them at school and when their daddy's presence shows up, now the presence brings his protection. It's amazing. Praise summons his presence. His presence brings with it his protection. We feel protected when we know that God is with us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. God is with us because praise summons his presence. His presence brings with it his protection. His protection produces in our hearts his peace. Isn't that amazing? That when you know God is with you, There's a peace in us in knowing that everything is going to be all right because the presence of God brings God's protection. His protection produces his peace. And when you get it, peace, peace unveils purpose. Peace unveils purpose. If you ever need to know the purpose, Lord, why am I here? Why is this happening? Get into a place of peace. Unplug. Get connected with God. Get in his presence. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will unveil the purposes of God. God's kingdom is always established in peace. His peace establishes his purpose. It unveils his purpose. Once you get an understanding of God's purpose for your life, then God sends his power. Power comes for purpose. Jesus said, he hath anointed me to open the eyes of the blind. Not just so that I will shake with the power or dance with the power or sing with the power. He's anointed me to be able to open the the, the eyes of the blind, to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead. He's anointed me to proclaim the good news. He's anointed me. The anointing, the power always comes for purpose. So whenever you get into God's peace because of his protection and his protection is there because his presence is there. His presence is there because we've summoned him with our praise. Praise brings God's presence. His presence brings his protection. His protection produces peace in our heart. The peace unveils God's purpose. 
The purpose summons God's power and the power releases God's provision. So you see, there's a process to being able to get to the provision. So we don't just run to him and say, Daddy God, this is what I need. Get into his presence. In his presence, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. My God, he's got so many blessings that he has in store for us that he wants to bless us in incredible ways like we've never realized before that God has blessings in store for you to be able to use you and to bless you. And that's why right here in the house, whatever you need is already in the house. All I can tell you is that there's a miracle in the house. You don't even realize all of the resources that are in the house. The hurt that is here that God has already healed in somebody else's life. And listen, whenever you have been broken, you become a master at mending. And that's why God brings broken people into the church. Because if I've been broken, I become a master at mending. And not only do I become a master at mending, but if I've been hurt, if I've been wounded, I know what hurt looks like in the eyes of somebody else who's hurting. I know what hurt looks like. I know what abuse looks like in their eyes if I've been through abuse. I know what molestation looks like if I've ever been there. And without even saying anything, you recognize a glimmer in their eye. And there's something on the inside of you that can say, I've been there. God healed me of it. He brought me through it. If you've ever been through the loss of a spouse and and the deep loneliness and the pain of having, uh, uh, it's not that you just lose them, you lose part of yourself. I never realized this until a friend of mine lost his wife. And he said, I didn't realize that when I lost my wife, I lost half of my mind because she carried so much information that I depended on her to provide. So when she was there, She gave him that. And when she was no longer there, he realized I've lost, I've lost half of my mind. I've lost half of my memories because she always handled that. She always knew this. You don't just lose the person. You lose part of what they supplied in your life. And sometimes when they're now gone, now when you're dealing with those depths of loneliness, where do I go? That's why David says, I want to be in your house, God, because not only is God there, but God's people are there who can remind you of the provisions of God when God has provided for them. Everybody who's here is a testimony of some part of God's amazing grace in your life. You're a testimony of what God delivered you out of what he redeemed you from, what he saved you from, what he healed you from and rehabilitated you from. You are a miracle proof. Every person that has been through a dark night, you're the the proof of Psalm 30 that weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the... You know what that tells us is that darkness is temporary. Darkness is temporary. Darkness is temporary. Weeping may endure for a a night while things are dark, it is temporary. Whatever you're dealing with, it is temporary. Whatever you're dealing with, it is temporary. And God has a plan. He has a plan. And that's why when you come in the house and you see somebody who has gone through process, it is a testimony because I'm telling you behind every strand of, 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 strain of, uh, uh, strand of gray hair is a testimony. <laughs> behind every character line in a face, is a testimony behind every love handle. <laughs> There's a testimony, I'm telling you. And, and if you just realize that, hey, God, God has something, God's up to something. God is up to something in my life. That's why it's not just God directly, it's God with flesh on. In somebody else, the sons and the daughters of God that carry a testimony. And when you see that they are still standing, it becomes proof positive to you that God can deliver you too. It is the same God that hath delivered, who does deliver and who yet shall deliver. And it is their way of saying, I've been through the fire and my hair is not singed. I survived. And your very presence alone in God's house says to another person, So can you. So can you. You see, 
Jerusalem was looked at as a spiritual capital. It was the place where they went and, uh, and they worshiped there in Jerusalem. It was a spiritual capital. So in Luke chapter 10 and verse 30, then Jesus came and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem is a spiritual capital. And then he went to Jericho. Jericho is a place of prosperity. Uh, whenever you leave your place of spiritual empowerment, if you leave it, you go down to Jericho. You, you, it's, uh, the journey from there is down. You know why? Because the tab tabernacles of God, the houses of God were always built at an elevation where you had to ascend into the presence of God. You had to ascend. And, and, and here's one of the deals. The temple there in Jerusalem, it was built at a high elevation. And there were steps that were there. And God gave them in specific instruction. He says, don't build the steps the same dimension. We have building codes when we build now so that every step has to be seven inches or eight inches or nine inches, whatever it is, every step has to be that way uniformly so that you don't have to look down at the steps as you're going up the steps and down the step. Your kinesthetic sense will take over. But God says, I want you to build the steps at odd dimensions. And so they built the steps at uneven. So one step might have been seven inches. The other one was nine inches. The next one was eight inches. And if you tried to walk, walk them without looking, you would stumble. And it was God's way of saying to them, I don't want you to approach my house flippantly. I want you to think about every step that you're taking as you are ascending into the hill of the Lord. And, and coming in, he says, I don't want you thinking about a notification that you got on your phone and bills that are due and crazy things that your children did or that your grandchildren did or failed to do. He said, I don't want you thinking about that thing. I want you to set your mind on me as you're approaching my house. So God was saying, I want every step that you take toward me must be a step of intentionality. So he was telling them, be intentional, be intentional. And so here, this certain man, Jesus is sharing uh, an experience because he's teaching the people about their neighbor to get people out of the selfishness of themselves and to show us our connection, that we don't live in a silo. We are designed to live in a culture because when scripture, you have to understand, scripture is never written to the person, it's written to the church, it's written to the community. The book of Ephesians, it is, it's written to the church at Ephesus. It's written to the, the church, the collective church, the community of God. God places us in community. In Philippi, the church, the book of Philippians is written to the church at Philippi, the Colossians written to the church at Colossae. So he's writing to the church, not the individual. He's writing to the church so that everything that we do keeps us in harmony with our community. So the moment that I lie, I bring discord in my community. If I lie in my home, I bring discord in the community of my family. And that's why God would allow Ananias and Sapphira to die because they were about to break the unity of the community. It's not communism. It's community. It's community. God brings his people into community. So when he's writing the Bible, I know that we like to say, you know, this is written like, it's, like I'm the only person on earth. This is God's word directly to me. No, no, no. It's to a people. It's to a community. And it's to say to us that we are mutually connected in a network of mutuality. Our destinies are connected. My God, when you come and, and you see the pastoral staff and what God, when God blesses them, you ought to say goody because now that sets a pattern for my own life. And, and notice the Bible talks about the anointing coming on the head, ran down to the beard. The beard speaks of maturity because boys can't grow beards. And it speaks of maturity down to the garments. And it means that if I'm in the body, if I come into the alignment of the house, if I come into the alignment of the house, I get everything that's on the head is coming my way. It's coming my way. So when you say that I haven't made my money, always put these three little letters on it. Y-E-T. Yet. I haven't had my healing to manifest yet, but it's your faith that it is coming. 
I don't have all of the money yet. I haven't gotten the promotion yet. The house is not sold yet. I don't have the degree yet, but it is your faith that is being established because you see the devil will come with accusation and you can pivot that thing in your favor by simply inserting a yet because the devil will whisper to you the moment that you feel the pain in your left knee, you're not healed. The moment that you feel that discomfort in your back, you're not healed. But put the three little pivot on that yet, 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 yet. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Pivot that thing back into trusting God. That's just, just a three little letters can switch it on the dime to say, I don't have it yet. I've not I've been approved yet. The grant has not come yet. The scholarship is not there yet, but it is my faith that is coming. Can you imagine how Abraham would have been as he was getting older every year? And then the devil said, you know, you old, your wife old. You're going to have what? He should have just said, yeah, just, just that could have discombobulated the plan of the enemy by those three letters, by those three letters, those three letters. But when that in, in Luke chapter 10, when this Jesus is telling, he's trying to explain to people their neighbor and, 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 he, and he tells them that this certain man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and the Bible says that he fell among thieves. He fell among thieves. They stripped him of his clothing. They stripped him. Isn't it amazing that until you are stripped, they really can't wound you. Because you see, the garment of praise is a protection. The whole armor of God is a protection. They've got to strip you of what covers you in order to try to hurt you. They stripped him of his cup. Then they wounded him. They stripped him. And then the Bible says it, 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 uh, they departed, leaving him half dead. That's where the devil made his mistake. When he left him half dead. I read something in Pastor Chris's book when he was shot. And he was, he was, he was half dead, but he had a praying wife. Oh my God, I'm just telling you, the strength of the power of a wife's prayer for her husband is just like a mother's prayer. And, and he was left half dead. But here's the deal. Whenever you're half dead, you're also half alive. And all that God needs is that half that's alive. That becomes the glimmer of your hope. And whatever has shot you, because there are different things that will shoot you and will bring pain into your life and that will cause you to think that it is so it's so over and this is so incredibly painful and so burning in my life that sometimes death seems more comfortable but sometimes the prayers that are being prayed on your behalf starts calling you back and so there are some situations that will happen to you that will so slam you that will so stun you that will so pierce you that it will leave you half dead but then you ought to say, I'm not dead yet because if I'm half dead, I'm half alive. And I mean, if you've got to come out of that thing, dragging one leg and dragging one arm and take your time over a period of days and weeks and months in recuperation and painful therapy. And sometimes here's the deal that I want you to understand that if you were strong enough to endure the affliction and the trauma, you have the grace also to endure the rehabilitation. And sometimes the rehabilitation can be as painful and sometimes more painful than the trauma itself. And that's why you have to have a picture of somebody that comes because it was interesting there that when he was left half dead and here comes a priest and I guess he said, I know I'm in good hands now. But the priest said, you know, the Bible said that he just crossed on the other side. And then here comes a Levite. Surely the Levite will help him. And he went on the other side. And then here comes the Samaritan. The Samaritans were the despised cousins of the Jews. They knew what rejection felt like. They had gone through the pain. So they recognized it in the wounded man who was half dead. 
And the pain that they had been through connected them. Pain connects you with other hurting people. And if you've ever been there, it's like I never want to see a child abandoned. I never want to see the negative words from a parent coming and injuring a child's self-esteem. I never want to see that. And you can recognize that when you realize something is not quite right in this situation. Here comes the Samaritan now. The Bible says, as he journeyed, as he journeyed. It didn't say that the priest nor the Levite were journeying. A journey is intentional. That's a part of his road. You don't have to go out of your way to look for ministry. God will put people on your journey. He'll put people on your journey. It's, it's wonderful just being in a, in a casual setting with, with, with Pastor Chris and, and, uh, and Vanessa. They, they will stop and, and pray with people right there. It's not, they won't just, you know how some people will just be very dismissive and say, say you know, I'll remember you in prayer. I'll, I'll pray about you. And that's, when, when they say that, that was their prayer. <laughs> They're finished, right? They're finished at that point. But they will stop right there in the moment. So can I pray with you about this? And commence to praying right then, right there. When you find praying people, it's because they've been through painful situations that have led them to prayer. They believe in its power. It's not a religious activity. It is a connection to the divine resources of heaven to be able to reach in with the hand of faith and pull them down into earth. It's to invoke his presence that then brings his protection, produces his peace, that unveils his purpose, that sends his powers, that releases his provision on behalf of his people. And so he's just inviting us into an experience with him. They had compassion on him. They had compassion on him and brought him into a place. And here David just said one thing about his eye of the Lord. I love the Bible in Ezra chapter 9 and verse 8 and 9. It says, but now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. Notice that for a brief moment, a brief moment, he's given us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. That's in his sanctuary. You know that there's relief from your bondage in the sanctuary? Relief. Give you a little relief from your bondage. You draw strength. You leave this place inspired, encouraged, informed, invigorated, and with a mission to be able to recognize other hurting people because Jesus was trying to let them know that your neighbor is not the person who just lives next door to you. Your neighbor is anybody who's in need. They're anybody who's in need. You'd be surprised. There are people that live in a bigger, finer house than you might live in. But they're in need. And you have something that they need. You will be surprised. Do You know, for every seat that is in the sanctuary of God, God had a soul in mind. He has a soul in mind. And I want you to recognize yourselves as good Samaritans because you're going to meet people in the areas of shopping, in, a, in, a, in an eating restaurant, in the grocery store. You're going to meet somebody that you don't have to go out of your way. It's on your journey. It's on your journey. It's on your journey at the bank, at the post office. It's on your journey at the restaurant, at the mall. It's on your journey. You don't even have to go out. They, they parked near you. It's at the gym, at, at a machine around you. You don't have to go out of your way. God will place them on your journey. They'll be standing in line in front of you or behind you or somewhere to the side of you. You don't have to go out of your way. They'll be on your journey. The Samaritan, as he journeyed, and that's why we just have to say, God, give me eyes. Give me eyes. David says one thing about desire of the Lord. One thing, one thing, one thing. He was not confused. And I don't know any one person that only just has one issue that they're dealing with. <laughs> you know, and particularly as we get older, as we get older, I mean, you, you just have to sometimes just get up and look in the mirror to see how much damage was done overnight. <laughs> and, and you don't want to, ask, you know, the older that we get, you, you, you don't make sudden moves. You can throw something out of joint. 
you, you have to ease into it. You, 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 you have to ease out of a chair and you have to ease into the chair. You, and, uh, and, and it's always something that happens to something. And as soon as you get the, 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 the shoulder right, and now it's the elbow and now it's the, it's the right knee and it's the, the left hip. And, and, and it's, it's another thing that's going on. It's always something. And so if God ever says, that's, that's one thing, this one thing about desire to the Lord. I don't know anybody that just has one little issue where they said, Lord, if you fix that, if you, the, the left knee, the, the little issue that I've been having, uh, you know, I've, I've not been hearing as clearly out of my, out of my left ear. Lord, if you, just, if you just deal with that, everything else will be perfect. I don't know anybody who just has one issue. But here David narrowed his thing down. And I just want you to understand that it must have great significance. If he would narrow that thing down, one thing have I desired of the Lord. And that will I seek after. I'm going to pursue this. That I might dwell in your tabernacle. In your sanctuary. That I might be in the house of God. The house of God is a gift for us. That is so meaningful. That Jesus died to be able to provide life for it. When the first Adam was put to sleep, Eve was born. But when the last Adam, Jesus Christ, was put to sleep in death, the church was born. And that's why the Bible says to the husbands in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. The way that Christ loved the church is that he died for it. And that's why when a man really lives and gives himself to his wife, he has to die to himself. Every time that he allows her to go shopping, he's dying to himself. <laughs> As he sits out patiently waiting while she tries on new things and looks at something, though she has a thousand at home. <laughs> he is dying to himself. But here's, here's some good news that I want you to notice from the word of God that relate to the house of God. And I love for God's house to have a heart for the house. In Psalm chapter 92, verse 12 through 15, but the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Notice, notice that the godly will flourish. And it says, then, for they are transplanted to the Lord's own house, and they flourish in the courts of our God. And then you'll notice that God says, for even in old age, they will still produce fruit, and they will remain vital and green. God says, I'll keep you relevant. Just when you stay connected to my house, when you stay connected to my house, I'm going to make you notice. He says, they will declare the Lord is just. He is my rock. But he says, the old King James version says, they'll be fat and flourishing. You know, that was a sign of prosperity, of, of anointing, you know, because if you didn't have enough, you were emaciated. So it was a sign that God, will, you, you will be fulfilled and that you will still bring forth fruit in your old age. It is a sign of the vigor of God. And listen, the great power of being able to still produce fruit in old age is the power of connection. It is to say, as I remain connected, notice the moment that you leave your Jerusalem, your life begins to go down. When God called Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach against that city, he went down to Joppa down to the shipyard, got down on the ship, was thrown overboard and went down into the, the, the belly of a fish that took him down to the bottom of the ocean. And it shows you that whenever you walk away from what God instructs you to do, your life will begin to go down. But when you stay connected to the vine where the life is, and Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches, that's where the, the fruit grows. And it's when you still keep a vibrant relationship of being connected not only to Jesus, but being connected to his body, the church. We are the body of Christ. We are the body of Christ. And he connects us. And that's why there has to be a heart. Because you know what the heart does? The heart makes sure that there is not stagnation, but circulation. 
When you have a stroke, it's a clot that blocks the circulation. And God wants us to have the freedom of circulation so that blood is oxygenated. And that's why we have this intricate system of arteries and veins. Veins are taking deoxygenated bl blood back to the heart to be oxygenated again. And, and the arteries are taking away the oxygenated blood and taking it to all of the organs to be able to provide health and strength and nutrition to them. It's to be circulated. When you come here, this is a heartbeat. And that's why you ought to have a heart for the house because there's something that you get here that people don't understand until you're in the atmosphere. And this is why David, not a foolish man, he had a job, but he didn't ask to be out in the field with the sheep. He says that I may dwell in the house of God. I want to be in your house, God. One thing, one thing about it. If I, if I don't get anything, if I only had one wish, it would be God that I can be in your house, connected to you and connected to the people who also serve you. Everybody needs a church, no matter how much money you have, no matter how little you have, no matter how much education you have, no matter how little you have, no matter whether you have children or not, everybody needs a place. In Japan and certain places in Europe now, they have such a problem with loneliness that they've had to create ministers of loneliness to be able to try to take care of lonely people. The church is God's answer for loneliness. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Somebody else is just waiting for an invitation for you to be in the house. Go and give it to them in Jesus' name. God bless you. I hope you got something out of the word of the Lord today.